their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. We're going to talk to our friends at NCBA Clusa. Good morning, everybody. Hey, good morning. Good morning. And we have sad news to talk about this morning. Uh, who would like to explain what happened in Uganda? Well, Vern, maybe I'll. Uh, this is Doug O'Brien. I'm I'm the president and CEO of, of uh, NCBA Clusa. Maybe I'll talk about it for a little bit, and then I'll ask one of our senior leaders, our, our chief financial officer who's been very involved to uh, to talk through uh, more of what happened. So, you know, first of all, I do want to wish your listeners a happy new year. And it's, it's with mixed emotion that uh, NCBA CLUSA moves into 2019 because right at the end of 2018, on uh, December 17th, we learned of a tragedy in one of our projects. And Vern, you know well, and, and uh, many of your listeners uh, also know that the National Cooperative Business Association, CLUSA, uh, our association that that works with cooperatives here in the United States to promote and, and defend cooperatives. We also do a lot of work internationally. We're in about 20 different countries using the cooperative principles in international development to empower people in their economy, in their businesses, in their community. One of these projects is in East Central Africa, in Uganda. And the project works with youth, uh, empowering them, giving them entrepreneurial skills, helping them form cooperatives. We had nearly 40 team members, my colleagues, our colleagues, working with the youth across Uganda. They were on a retreat uh, on December 17th, uh, doing a a staff retreat and staff training. And um, all but three of our colleagues were on a bus, and the bus um, was on a hill, and, um, and it appears that uh, we don't have the formal police report yet, but essentially what happened, there was a one vehicle accident and uh, half of the 36 people that uh, were on the bus perished. And so 18, actually more than half, there were 18 of our staff members and there were three others on the bus for a total of 21 people who died. The other people, the other 16 people who were on the bus uh, suffered uh, various injuries, some of them critical, some of them minor. So that was on December 17th, Vern, and since that time, the staff uh, for NCBA Clusa, both uh, in Uganda itself, as well as a number of key staff here in Washington, D.C., have been working around the clock to make sure that those survivors and the surviving families uh, had the support that they needed uh, to get, you know, to get through this uh, this early part of this tragedy. Uh, one other thing I'll I'll just mention before pausing is that um, is that we've seen in in enormous outpouring of support from the community and particularly the cooperative community uh, across the board that have reached out with their condolences and support. And we can talk a little bit more about um, how, uh, you know, the cooperative community can support other cooperatives in times of disaster in a moment. But um, but I'll pause and just uh, kind of stop for a moment before we hand it over to, to Val. You know, um, uh, just listening to you, Doug, I, I, I'm very sad over here that 21 lives are lost uh, right before Christmas, right before the end of the year. And I have it that NCBA Clusa, matter of fact, I have it that co-ops really do God's work. I mean, it's helping the poor. If you look at Uganda, do any studies on Uganda and other places around the world that you work in, it's places that are people impoverished. They are in poverty. And I, I would like to before we spend much more time talking about the tragedy, could somebody, Val or or Doug, uh, could you talk about the project that, that you were doing with the youth there? What, what's it called and yeah. what, what do you do? So the the project is called Youth Engagement Through Agriculture, and yet it for short. And the work was really, it was, it was uh, both individual and in groups of youth, teenagers typically, and working with them on building their business skills with a real focus on providing them opportunities to form cooperatives. Uh, it's, it's a very successful project. We've, we've helped 
you know, uh, hundreds of youth from impoverished communities in Uganda build their skills and, and are on a path of creating 25 cooperatives with these youth. I mean, it's a, it's a really powerful and a successful project. We've actually overperformed on all the goals that we had with this project. And it's, it's, a, it's a really excellent example of how the cooperative principles can be used uh, to empower people in their business and community. So that's the project, and the project is still there. And, and, and part of our work right now is, uh, and we're just in the middle of it really, is, is thinking about, okay, this is uh, – you know, we have a, we're in a different situation now. And so we are, um, we're in the middle of considering how do we, how do we continue and how do we, you know, make sure that we continue to serve these communities with this project in, in the best way possible. I thought a lot about this. And the only thing, I, Doug, that I can say, kind of like the benefit of a tragedy, is it really gets to focus in on what you're doing, why you're doing it, and maybe mm-hmm. even a stronger resolve to get it done in, in the name of these 21 people that died if for no other reason. What, is there a reason for such a tragedy and what's the benefits of what can we get accomplished uh, with such a tragedy? And I like you saying that the co-op community have really come together and maybe this is something that will help us to come together and get more done in 19. What do you think about yeah. that? Yeah, friend. I would like to add that. Could you give me your, your our, name? Give me give it. This is Val Roach, the chief financial officer of NCBA Clusa. Okay, thank you, Val. Yeah. Yes, um, I'd like to add that um, two of our critical goals in managing our programs are one resilience and two sustainability. And so the resilience, I'd say the team that we've built and the survivors that are continuing on the um, program and that we are, you know, prayerful that they will heal are resilient. They have um, a strength and capacity that's indescribable. And um, with the energy that's been placed on the program work that they've done, um, we have key stakeholders and the beneficiaries that they have truly worked really hard to ensure that that entrepreneurial spirit and building agricultural needs with the youth to ensure that they have economic development resources. We are prayerful that we'll be able to continue that within the country uh, with the team that's on the ground there. And I could see just from visiting the the injured that that resilience exists in their will to heal and to continue. uh, Okay, let me just, you went over and visited there after the accident? Yes. I did. I was on the ground just three days after the incident. We also have a few other individuals that went out into the field as well, another senior leader, to ensure that we were able to provide proper care that we could navigate and um, to ensure that our team are able to receive the proper care, that their families are receiving the needs and support that is needed in this tragedy. What were they mainly needing? I know comfort, but the family, there's 21 families that passed, 18 of which were employees of NCBA Clusa, and about the same number were in hospitals. When I, it was 200 miles away, the hospital. Just getting them to the hospital, I guess, was harsh. But Yeah, so there was a lot of, um, I'd say, mobility that was really um, needed and the strength of our team. And, and that's where this, you know, our goal and um, our strength on building resilience with our own team, we could definitely see the energy. So there was a lot of work of, you know, just being able to ensure that the medical facilities could support the needs of the injured. And so there was transportation provided throughout the region. Um, to ensure that they were re- uh, receiving the proper medical attention at various hospital locations. So there's, you know, travel resources, making sure that the staff could get there, but also visiting the staff. And um, now it's making sure that they receive the proper medical care. And we are convinced that they're in the right locations as a hospital and receiving the, um, the adequate care um, within the country. What about the families of the of the em- employees that, that were lost? How could you support them, or how can the co-op community support them? 
Yeah. Um, well, you know, being the sole, I think most of them were the sole breadwinner of their families and the the resources that they were providing. And, um, you know, some of the, the employees actually lived within the many villages. Their permanent residents were within the villages, but they had temporary housing within the city of Kampala and various areas where they're working throughout Uganda. So it's a continued resource of, you know, now um, either sustaining their temporary residence, so they need housing assistance for the families, you know, resources such as food, you know, during the, the burial moments. You know, there are lots of cultural and traditionary things that require, you know, uh, making sure that the family and the guests are fed. Um, there's also a tradition in the hospitals, important, so making sure that that individual that's staying, um, providing that um, 24-hour support system has, you know, food and, and so forth within the hospital. You know, the injured um, themselves, you know, we have medical care, uh, but, you know, you know that even in the U.S., there are caps to insurances, so we want to make sure that we have the ability to continue their medical services no, no. as well. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry yes. to cut you off, but we've got to go into our first break. Okay. Um, so for everybody out there, please um, stay tuned. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOL, at 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. A little choked up today. We're talking about an accident that happened in Uganda on December the 17th. We have Mr. Doug O'Brien, the president of NCBA Clusa on the line, and Valerie Roach is their chief financial officer. And we have not... Heard from John yet? He's head of communications. Val, you were talking about the the problem there and the needs. Can either one of you talk a little bit about Uganda? I understand that this program for youth uh, works with about twenty six thousand youth in in Uganda. But can you give a little little sort of backdrop of Uganda? What's the population? Um, how poor are the folks there, or rich, or well, I'll just start, and I'm going to hand it over to, to Val. As she just said, she spent uh, nearly a week there, just returned. But Uganda is a, you know, it's a it's a nation in East Central Africa. It, like many countries in that region, the the vast majority of the population is, you know, what we would consider impoverished. Most of the people are still, you know, based in in agriculture. There are a number of cities there, but uh, but most people still live in the rural parts, and they rely on on agriculture and, and what here what we think in the United States is small scale agriculture uh, in a more communal way. So that's that's really one of the things that that we're working on with these thousands of youth is is to provide them opportunities and pathways, you know, to more success. You know, and I know Vernon, you've been there. The assets, the resiliency, as Val talked about. You know the the uh, the drive of the people in Uganda and in that region is is incredible. You know what they need is just a few more tools to empower themselves, uh, to sustain their livelihood, to improve their um, their lot and their family's lot. And that's that's one thing that I've certainly heard from the folks who have been working in Uganda, including in just this last couple of weeks, is is the drive of of the people we work with, and, and in fact, our staff there, our colleagues, how they are so focused on improving, you know, the opportunities for their families. So, so in many ways, it's a lot different than maybe, uh, you know, the the communities where most of your listeners are, Vern. But in in really important ways, it's the same. It's it's people who are looking for opportunity, looking for ways to take care of their family, looking for ways to serve their community. And um, and we had an opportunity, you know, we we've had some opportunities to to help people do that. So, Val, I'm not sure you want to, you know, provide some kind of direct testimony as you were just there just days ago. Definitely. Um, and just to give you an example of, you know, our employee base, uh, those that um, have passed on, um, every position in that office. 
a form of saving lives and providing resources to um, families. And um, in saying that, we have lost, you know, staff that are were drivers um, who provided transportation and guidance to the, the many sites where uh, we were working with youth, office assistants who supported and, and helped us to um, fulfill the commitments on the project by providing administrative support. They were the only ones working in their family. And um, so there is a, a lack of income. And those positions provided uh, opportunity in the future for their families. And they no longer have that opportunity. And, um, and so what we are faced with now, how can we continue to support those families and ensure that those that have left children behind have an opportunity and that they can also see that there there is a future and, and how can NCBA help make them believe that there is a form of sustainability that uh, we can provide for their futures? So I, I just want to get, you said it's agriculture, it's, it's small villages. Do they have electricity? Uh, do people go to school? Um, yes. That yes. takes a little bit. Mm-hmm. How, how is the food situation in Uganda? Yeah. The children go to school. Now, the educational systems may vary in different parts of the country and um, and whether or not the families are, you know, closer to the city or to a town that has a full formal educational system. But there are opportunities. And by providing employment to the, the Ugandan citizens, we've allowed them to be able to provide educational resources for their children to go to school as well. What about electricity? To their and income. Police. And they have electricity. Definitely there's electricity. Um, there are village areas that electric, electricity does not extend. So that is an issue um, in certain parts of Uganda. It's very high with mobile cell phones. There's also limitations with, um, you know, banking resources, but mobile banking is a way that we're able to, even with our own participants in our programs and training, is to get, you know, cash and resources to people. So there are alternatives in place, but it's definitely, you know, different living environment than what we experience on a day-to-day um, basis. And I mentioned earlier one of the um, support systems that we want to work with supporting is the alternate living arrangements where some of our, you know, staff in the communities, they live in the city temporarily. So they're paying rent in Kapala, but their families live in um, a distant village, you know, hours outside of the city where they're still having to support um, their beneficiaries. And how do we continue to manage this process while we work through, you know, kind of um, long-term sustainability for their their families who may not have the ability of um, an educated person that ha- or a skill set that hasn't been fostered to allow them to go into the workforce. Wow. And Doug, you were going to say something? Yeah. You'd asked earlier about ways to support, you know, the, the people affected by this tragedy and and I'm going to ask John Torres to talk for a little bit about something that, um, you know, that, that we've been talking about here is that the Cooperative Development Foundation, 501c3, is uh, reminding folks that the cooperative community has a longstanding tradition of helping in times of need. Uh, and there's a disaster fund. And there's links on the CDF website. There's links to um, to this fund on some of our uh, the press releases related to this tragedy. Uh, so that's that's available. And John, I'm not sure if you want to say anything else about this. No, no thank you, Doug. I, I think that uh, that's important for folks to know that there are outlets available to them to uh, to help. And the Cooperative Development Development Foundation is a uh, wonderful organization that has been able to provide this outlet for a great many disasters as folks try to recover. And so you can go to uh, the Cooperative Development uh, Foundation's page at cdf.coop, that's cdf.coop, and, and look at that fund and see all the wonderful work that it's, uh, that it's been uh, doing for the cooperative community throughout this country and, and around the world. So 
cdf.coop is a place that our listeners can go to, anybody can go to, to provide funds for any disaster. Can you give us, John, a couple disasters that they've had in the past? Sure. In North Dakota, there was a food cooperative that had damage, uh, flood damage after um, some uh, extreme weather. They've uh, replaced uh, coffee processing equipment uh, following an earthquake in Ecuador. And these are all to help cooperatives get back up on their feet and help the families that are supported by those cooperatives and the community in which those cooperatives function. And so it runs the gamut from uh, from smaller disasters to, to some larger natural disasters uh, that this fund is able to uh, support those in the community that are there to to better themselves and 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 better each other. And so, as Doug mentioned earlier, uh, there's a tremendous outpouring from the cooperative community, and you know we feel honored uh, to be part of this community that has really uh, stepped up when uh, cooperatives need the help. Well, I remember Hurricane Sandy, um, with that hit New York, and up that the CDF came through the disaster fund for cooperatives, particular housing co-ops, I believe, when FEMA didn't help. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. The, yeah. the CDF Disaster Fund was used to help people affected by the more recent hurricane affected Puerto Rico and, and Texas and Florida. And, and uh, we saw a lot of support in that. And that was just in, in 2017. OK, we're going to go to our second break and we're going to come back and talk more about the great work, God's work, if you will, that uh, NCBA CLUSA does around the world and this tragedy and any kind of support one can give. We'll be right back. Please don't touch that dial. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOM, 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. The program is Everything Cooperative, and I'm your host, Vernon Oaks, and we have on the line with us this morning Doug O'Brien, the president of NCBA CLUSA, John Torres, who's in charge of their communications, and new to the program is Valerie Roach, who is the person in charge of the money, financial. <laughs> We're talking about a major tragedy that happened in Uganda. First, we're talking about the great work that NCBA CLUSA does around the world. And Doug talked about taking the cooperative principles and helping to spread them throughout the world. Doug, one of the things that I like when we talk about the values and principles of cooperation is the ethical values. They say the cooperative founders believe in the ethical values of honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for one another. And this caring for one another is what the co-op world does and does so greatly. And this is why I believe that you have this outpouring from the co-op world when this tragedy happens to, to the folks in Uganda. Do you have a sense that that's what's happening here? So I, I think that's absolutely the case. Your listeners probably know, you certainly know, two of the, the seven cooperative principles, the sixth principle of cooperation among cooperatives, and then the seventh principle of concern for community. I think those come together in times like these for members of cooperatives to reach out and support their brethren and sisters and you know fellow cooperators. It is part of, I, I believe, people who choose to be part of cooperatives they understand uh, the importance of, of putting people at the center. Uh, and, you know, in, in cooperatives' uh, case, it's the people in the center of, of a business. But that translates to, I think, to a real outpouring of, of support and empathy and sympathy in times of tragedy. You know, and that's why I think the CDF disaster fund that we talked about in the last uh, in the last section there has been such an important tool for the cooperative community in times of tragedy. Well, I, I forgot where I got this from, but co-ops believe in people first, planet second, and profit third, mm. compared to the capitalistic model, which is they have three Ps too. It's profit, profit, profit. <laughs> it seems. <laughs> it seems. Okay. But people first, Planet profit, and I put a fourth P, and that's politics. We really have to be involved in the politics in order to help shape those policies that that the politicians are are 
out there doing that would help people, mm -hmm. uh, help mm -hmm. the planet. Who would like to talk more about what what is it that we can do as a community, as a co-op community? What what are the things that we can do to keep doing God's work? But particularly, again, when I look at tragedies, is this okay? What can we learn from this? And I get a, a even a more resolve in in 2019 of doing this work, of getting this knowledge out. The fifth principle is education, training, and information, and that's what they were going to do on this bus, was get this education and training and information so they could go back and help youth even more. So what can we do as as a community to help get this knowledge out? And this is the reason the National Cooperative Bank is sponsoring this program, to get the knowledge out about this co-op world and what it is that we do in it so more and more people can get involved in it so we can help one another. What, what can yeah, we do? If I Maybe I'll talk for a little bit, and then I want to I want to ask Val and and John to to talk also, maybe more specifically about about Uganda or whatever they want to talk about. But I think your your point is absolutely spot on. You know, we in the cooperative community we we know that uh, cooperatives are impactful in the community. We know that they're most effective, and they can really reach their potential only when you know more and more people understand what cooperatives are about and how they can be used to improve the lives of their families, improve the communities. And none of that happens by accident. I mean, it, it needs to be very deliberate. When we think of some historical examples of when co-ops have really kind of taken off and, and gone to scale, whether that's with rural electrics or agriculture, credit unions, food co-ops, this didn't happen by accident. It happened when people decided to to really invest their their time, their social capital, their financial resources into this strategy that has amazing outcomes, outcomes for the, the individual members and their families, but also outcomes for the communities. So, you know, what, what can we do? It, it, it comes down to some pretty, you know, some, some pretty straightforward tactics of making sure that if you're a member of a cooperative, that you're active that you continue, that you act on that fifth principle of education and training, and you continue to learn about how you can be a better member and a better participant in your cooperatives. But then we've, we've got to get out of our, our co-op bubble, if you will, and, and talk to people who don't understand it yet. And we need to do that in every forum. You know, this radio show is, and, and podcast is fantastic, but we need to think about uh, the networks that we have and in other, you know, in our business community, our social community, and our religious community to get the word out. Um, and that's through written, that's through doing, you know, going to talk to people either in public or privately. It's, uh, you know, it's the Cooperative Impact Conference that we hold in October, the Cooperative Festival that we do every every other year. And it's, you know, it's, it's just doing it every day and doing more and more that we can. JT, this is a, maybe a, a question for the vice president of public relations and how do how do we do this how do we get the word out john i've never heard you i've never heard you be called jt i like that john Tory. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. It's, it's a term of endearment and i appreciate it um <laughs> yeah there, there's a great many things folks can do please just share the story share the story of your cooperative share the story of the interpersonal relationships you have with your fellow members and others in the community, and share those far and wide. Everyone has access to a social media account. Those can be used for good. And please, tell that story. Be those ambassadors and, and go out and, uh, and lift cooperatives up. And uh, as Vern said, uh, you know, there is uh, those three things, the, uh, the people, uh, the planet, and, and, and profit. And those first two, the people, and planet, those are what we focus on as cooperatives. And it's important that we that we raise those folks up and, and let folks know that these are folks that are empowering themselves, that they are taking care of their own communities, and, uh, and tell those stories. So please use those social media channels, share that information with each other, and uh, that's how we can get the, get the word out. And Val, what about what specifically can we do in Uganda for, for the families that are left behind without a breadwinner, without that that main person providing funds, and for those 26,000, 26 plus thousand youth. Did I read a stat that says that they live on $2 a week, $2 a month, $2 a day? There was some, when you say impoverished, I don't think we even know how bad mm -hmm. bad can be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. I think that um, we could, um, as co-ops, and um, that social responsibility aspect is really critical and that silent principle of providing a sense of hope to the families in any kind of way is is going to promote that um, resilience goal that uh, we definitely strive for. Um, One key area is the long-term recovery. It's really important that resources are provided for rehabilitation, you know, outpatient, you know, services, um, the home care, you know, their families, you know, food source, um, continuing to make sure that they have, you know, meals um, and uh, resources for you know, clean water um, in some of the areas where they live and that the children are able to continue um, in school um, of the deceased. You know, we have tuition, you know, payments and things of that nature. Well, being on the ground, you know, asked to say, well, school payments are due and we don't have access to any of the resources that the staff members, their bank accounts, because things are shut down right now, as um, the police report, as Doug mentioned earlier, and other things that are required to close out and to give access to beneficiaries. So there's a great deal of limitations for just the day-to-day uh, economic needs of the family. So when I heard about this, and I wasn't going to say the amount, but I'll go ahead and say it here. I I, I got my checkbook out and not the well credit card out and sent $250 to CDF. Now, I did want to know, is there a way, particularly when you talk about long term, if sort of I said I wanted to get $50 a month just ongoing, could, could it be set for Uganda? Can CDF do it? I know we don't have anybody from CDF on the line, but could they could they say, here's money that I want to set specifically for this project? Is there a way of doing that? Hmm. JT, I think I might ask you to to uh, respond to that. That's a good question, uh, Vernon. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question, Vernon. And I think that uh, over time, as we get into the recovery aspect of this, and we look at the long-term, kind of the long-term strategy of how we're going to move forward, uh, that could definitely be part of the mix. Uh, you know, as as that goes, there's a lot of conversation that does need to happen with the Cooperative Development Foundation and how that would work. But you know, I think that there uh, there is an appetite for folks to to provide some continuous support, uh, and so that's definitely something we're going to look at uh, in the coming months as we uh, work on the recovery aspect for this. But thanks for bringing that up. Okay, I really wanted to know if there was a way that I wanted to personally do that too, and so it's like I assume there may be some other people out there. Uh, partic- I hadn't even thought Val of long term for these families the main breadwinner may not be there and they may have, you know, spouse and children in a village somewhere, wasn't even in a city. And and mm-hmm. you, you said there was temporary housing. Uh, it's a whole lot, it sounds like. It's not just how do you bury yeah. somebody? It's like how do you bury and sustain over over time? Okay. Yeah. Anything else, Valerie, we can do? Yeah. I think your your kind words, your kind support, they're the hearts um, and the zeal that um, the survivors and even the families of the deceased, uh, they're so warm-hearted and they're so thankful and grateful for the support that NCBA CLUSA has provided. And um, they extend their arms to all of us to, you know, help them. And um, if we can't directly help them, indirectly lead them the way to um, someone else that can support them. And so our our hearts and our arms are open to embrace them however we can. Well, I've been threatening, and I keep telling Doug, when he takes some of these trips, I like to hang alone and see. I've only been in in the, what's that? I've been in Sierra Leone and one other, Gambia. I haven't been on the other coast, so maybe Uganda would be a place. But I really want to see the work uh, with these young folks. I'd like to see the the co-ops. You said at 25 different co-ops, 25 different businesses being developed that can help people sustain themselves. So when can we take a trip? Maybe we yeah. – I know there was a group of people that went to Haiti, a group of cooperators that went to Haiti. Maybe we can get a group to go to Uganda. What do you think? That's yeah. a great idea. Let's keep talking about that, Vern, okay. whether it's Uganda or someplace else. I, mm-hmm. You know, Val, of course, is, was just there, likely in the near term. I'm, I'm going to have an opportunity to be there. But um, but it, it really is, I think, the, the reason you um, – one of the reasons that, that, you know, that you bring this up, Vern, is that you, when, when you spend time on the ground, you've done it. 
and you spend time with the people in these communities, it is pretty transformational uh, in terms of the way that you look at that you look at life, but the way that you look at at how cooperatives with the principles can really mean to uh, to people and and to people who who uh, you know really need opportunity and and an opportunity to be more resilient and sustainable. So Doug, uh, let's take yeah, this up on the other side of our last break. <laughs> let's let's spend some more time talking about what we can do and sort of like plan out future stuff. We'll be right back. <laughs> Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOF, 95.9 FM. That's right. Information is power, and that's why WL is a great, great partner for this program. But Papa Sin from NCBA Clues in our first month here on the program five years ago said it's not information that's power. Um, Papa sent it from Senegal. He said it's when you use the information, when you put action to it, that's where you get your power. And Dame Pauline Green said that uh, cooperatives help people come out of poverty with dignity. And I uh, like that a lot, I come out of poverty with dignity. So what we're talking about is Uganda. This could happen anywhere in the world, including right here in the United States, help people come out of poverty with dignity. And what we were talking about before the break, uh, we have Doug O'Brien I'm John Torres, JT, and Valerie Roach on the line with us. And we were talking about some of the things we can do long-term to help people come out of poverty with dignity. So what are some of the other ideas you guys thought about in, 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 during the break? <laughs> I was going to just add to one of the um, important areas is for us to provide counseling and resources to uh, the extended families. You know, dealing with a tra tragedy is not easy. And uh, we want to make sure that there is transitional support for the families and that they know that um, there's a listening ear and some comfort that can be provided when the family themselves may be broken, that there's some extent external resources that can be extended to the family. Is there any any kind of culture things that would get in the way of counseling in Uganda? No, fortunately, Uganda does have um, counseling services locally, so it is a common um, area that the um, the locals can reach out to. Fantastic. And so we were very pleased to find that there are local resources. And I think it's really important that local resources are provided because you also have the cultural support that's needed and the approach and tactic of the delivery of the counseling may be unique and would make sure that those areas of um, sensitivity are being accomplished appropriately. Doug? Yeah, I think the in terms of how to respond and, and how to support the folks in Uganda, uh, I'll, I'll take it a, a little bit more general in that just making sure that, that people from across the world in Uganda and Africa and, and other parts of the world have access to the ability to create cooperatives. And that means that information and, and you know, the ability to act on the information, as you said, with, with Papa Sen, but it also means you know, the, the ability to have access to great trainers and actually a, a legal environment that allows them to form cooperatives. There's, there's actually many countries in, throughout the world that um, that enabling legislation isn't there. So that's, that's something that we, we work on with the International Cooperative Alliance. Those are some key ways to support, you know, people generally. And now that there's, there's thousands of people in Uganda who, who now have a better understanding, a much deeper understanding of what cooperatives can mean. I think these, these types of uh, strategies are, are, uh, you know, are, are even more important in Uganda than, than they were before. And I'll, I'll just mention, and I know we, we talked about it a couple times, but that CDF disaster fund is available, uh, is, is always available, actually, for people who want to support other cooperators, the cooperative community in times of disaster. And, and, um, and you just look up the Cooperative Development Foundation website and, and uh, you'll be able to find a way to, to be able to participate and support, you know, other cooperators in, in times of need. Well, Doug, R Roberta McDonald from Cabot Creamery said on this program that the people from NCB are angels. 
uh, with the work that they do. And I, 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 I want to extend that to in, people from NCBA or Angels and what the work you're doing, like you're doing God's work, really helping people pull themselves up collectively, working together, how they can mm-hmm. help themselves, their families, and their communities. So do you all like what you do? <laughs> I'll, I'll, get, I'll go first. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> wants to go. Right. go first on this. Let me tell you. Hey, we're, yeah, we're all going to jump in on that. I'll, I'll be quick and and, and, uh, and look forward to hearing from my colleagues. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the the opportunity, and that's very kind of you to say about about uh, the team here at NCBA Clusa. But the opportunity to spend one's professional life in using you know the, the time and talents that we're given to help others and not to help others in a, you know, in, in a way that, that others might become dependent on you, but to help others become independent, mm. to help others become resilient and sustainable. It's, it's a huge privilege. And I, and I can tell you for one that, that um, I feel fortunate. I feel blessed that, that I have opportunity to do this kind of work. So yeah, I like my job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And so now I would just add, you know, I go beyond liking. I love what I do. I love having the opportunity to be able to have an impact on um, people's lives and the success of seeing the improvement is extremely rewarding. I've been doing this um, for 30 years, and I I, I just cannot see another um, career path or an opportunity to service people, and I just really enjoy what I do. Serving people, yeah. all right. Absolutely, I'll echo all of those all of those sentiments. And to uh, to hear the stories and to be involved in telling that story is such an honor. And um, you know, wake up every day just absolutely privileged to be able to do this work and to work with this this group of fine people and uh, do the work that we do uh, both here in the states and overseas. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege. And uh, as Val said, I I couldn't imagine doing anything else. It's a very fulfilling career and a very fulfilling life. Well, 10 years ago, I figured out what I want to be when I grow up, and I'm doing it now, and that's promote and develop co-op for the reasons that you all talked about. We talked about three of the principles, uh, five, six, and seven, but one, two, three, and four are all about co-ops are open for everybody. Uh, It's through democratic control. They must be controlled. They have control of the organization. They must be able to make the decisions. And there's some money that goes in and money that comes out. So people can get financially uh, secure and socially secure, create financial wealth and social wealth in a world that's becoming more and more divided. I don't know if you guys see it, but I do. It's just the haves versus the have not. The, 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 the gap is getting bigger and bigger, and it looks like it will be even bigger as time goes by if we don't do something like cooperation. Any comments on that statement? Yeah, well, couldn't agree more. We also know that um, that in times when when people, when an increasing number of people feel excluded, feel excluded from their economy, feel excluded from their society, from their community, that it's a time when people can look to cooperatives to be included and to be empowered. And I think we're in one of those moments right now. I mean, it's a cooperative moment of people. And you, you know, I'm I'm not going to name you know particular uh, proof points here, but I but I think a lot of listeners would agree that there's just a lot of people in the United States and across the globe that are that are feeling really discouraged about their place in the economy, feeling discouraged about how they're um, how they're treated or the power that they have. Co-ops are one of the strategies uh, that has been proven that has gone to scale in certain sectors in certain parts of the world that have empowered people, empowered them economically, empowered them societally. Uh, so I, I, I couldn't agree more, Bert. I would encourage everybody out there, and, and the three of you too, if you haven't, go to everything.coop. That's the webpage here. Last week's speaker was Philip Thompson, the deputy mayor for New York City. He's in for policy for strategic initiatives. And he talked about this co-op business and this co-op world. And he first started off with, Nine million people in New York, about f- half of them cannot afford child care and housing and food and health care. 
uh, and some of the initiatives and co-ops is one of the, the things he has in his bag to, to help the folks in New York. So we're talking about Uganda, but it's right here in the U.S., right here in D.C., in every aspect, in rural and in urban areas, and co-ops can be one of the tools. So we have about a minute left, minute and a half, so anybody want to talk about that future? Not only Uganda, but here in the U.S. Well, the future, the future can be, and I think it has to be, a future where people are empowered in their business, empowered in their community, um, empowered in the economy, and the strategy is cooperative. And so we think about that here in the United States, but, you know, right now our minds are very much in Uganda and thinking about those 26,000 youths, about our 40 team members that were there and the 18 colleagues at NCBA Clusive that spent the past years uh, committed to empowering people through the cooperative business model, through entrepreneurialism. And we think of them, we are in solidarity with the survivors, with the families, with our staff. And uh, and we think about ways that we can support them through prayer, if that's a, a way uh, that one chooses through, through different types of, of giving. The CDF disaster fund is available, as we've talked about a few times at, at the CDF website. For, for cooperators in times of need. So it's the future. Uh, we, we're living in the present right now, but um, but we have to look uh, toward the future and to a better future uh, for the yep. people in Uganda and for the people across the world. You've got the last word. Everybody out of my listeners, please live a cooperative week and go to cdf.coop. We appreciate you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Thank you, Ray. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WO and 95.9 FM.